So this is our AP Chemistry Chapter 7 Lesson Video Part 3, and we're going to focus on Section 7.7 .7 and 7.8, so we will make it to the end. Alright, so 7.7 .7 is group trends for the active metals. So the alkaline metals, which are group 1, and the alkaline earth metals, which are group 2, are considered the active metals. Um, so as you go towards the left and right of the periodic table, except for the noble gases, reactivity increases. Okay, so that's why they're called the active metals. So what are some properties of alkali metals? Well, they're soft metallic solids with low melting points. Hey, okay, y'all saw in honors chem when I cut the sodium metal with a spatula. When bonded with hydrogen, the hydrogen has a negative one charge and becomes a hydride. So if it reacts with hydrogen, it'll become a metal hydride. It reacts vigorously with water. It normally will produce um, a hydroxide and hydrogen gas. And then when bonded with oxygen, they can form the following. They can form an oxide, where O has a usual negative 2 charge. It can form a peroxide, where O2 has a negative 2 charge. Um, or it can form a superoxide, where O2 actually has a negative 1 charge. Obviously, we won't focus on superoxides very much. And for peroxides, the main one you need to know is hydrogen peroxide. All right, so let's look at some equations. So it says write a balanced equation that predicts the reaction of cesium metal with the following. All right, so first we are starting with cesium metal and chlorine gas. All right, so we have cesium, we have chlorine. This is going to be a basic synthesis reaction. So cesium has a positive one charge, chlorine has a negative one charge, so my charges are balanced. So then I just need to go back and balance the entire equation. So I have one CS, one CS, two CLs, but one CL, so I'll put a two. But now I have two cesium, so I need a two in front of that. All right, so that's just a basic synthesis reaction. All right, so next we're uh, having it react with water. Okay, so we have cesium plus water. So like I said, what's going to happen is it's going to form a hydroxide. Okay, so we're going to have cesium with a positive, hydroxide with a negative. <coughs> oh no, hope I don't start this again today. Um, but we'll also have hydrogen gas left over. Okay, so in other words, it's going to grab the OH from water, but then there will be an H left over that will form hydrogen gas. But remember, hydrogen is a diatomic one, by itself. So I need to go back and balance this. So 1 CS, 1 CS, 2 H's. I have 3 H's. So remember what I told y'all, if you have an oddball, just double it to make it even. But now I have 2 cesium, so I'm going to put a 2 here. I have two H's, here I have two plus two, which is four H's, so I need a two here. And then two O's and two O's. All right, so hopefully that one went too bad. All right, and then last is with hydrogen. So remember on the previous slide, I told you it's gonna make a hydride. All right, so cesium's positive two, hydride's H negative one, so I don't need to balance my charges. But since I have two H's, I put a two here, and now I have two cesium, so I put a two right there, just like that. So, hopefully that wasn't too bad. So let's see if you can do the next one. So for the next one, just pause the video, try it, and we'll hope you got it right. I'll assume you've done that, we'll look at it together. So it says write the balance uh, equation for a reaction between potassium metal, so potassium's K, and sulfur, sulfur's S. See how this is just a basic synthesis reaction, so make sure you look at your charges. So K is going to be positive, S is going to be negative 2, so I need 2 Ks to balance my charges. And then once I have 2 Ks, I'll put a 2 right here. Alright, so hopefully you got that one right. That was pretty simple. Really, you just got to remember to balance your charges. Alright, so that was alkali metals. Now let's look at alkaline earth metals. So alkaline earth metals are harder and more dense than alkali metals. They have higher melting points than alkali metals, and they're less reactive with water. So this, for example, I think this was either sodium or lithium with water. So if you look, we're getting sparks, we're getting fire. This right here, I believe, is just calcium with water. So if you look, no fire, no sparks, we're just kind of bubbling a little bit. So I mean, it's okay to watch, I guess, but nothing like an alkali metal, which would be much more exciting. All right, so last section is 7.8. This is group trends for selected non-metals. All right, so hydrogen is an al in the alkali metal group, even though it is a non-metal. It can be metallic under extremely high pressures. So it belongs in group 1 because it has one valence electron and can form a positive one charge, like all the alkali metals. 
However, it kind of belongs in group 17 because it is a nonmetal and it can form a negative one charge like all the other halogens. And it only needs one more electron to achieve noble gas configuration. Woo, I spelled configuration wrong right here. There should be no U right there. I don't even think spell check caught that. It might have. I'll probably go back to my computer and it'll be underlined when I look at it. All right, so that's why some periodic tables you'll see hydrogen in its normal spot, but then you'll see hydrogen added over here because it kind of belongs in both places. So nonmetals. When you go down a group of nonmetals, the elements go from nonmetallic to metallic. So if you look, we start out with nonmetals, then we hit metalloids, then we hit metal. So the lower you go, the more metallic a substance is on the nonmetal side. So now let's focus on the halogens. That's group 17. Fluorine is just a pale yellow gas. Chlorine is a greenish yellow gas. Bromine is a reddish brown liquid. And iodine is a gray black solid that forms purple vapors. Halogens are very reactive. They are one electron away from having a stable noble gas configuration. All right, and then last column, of course, is group 18, the noble gases. Noble gases have full outer energy levels, so they are very unreactive, so that means their electron configuration is S2P6, full eight valence electrons. They rarely form compounds, but compounds have been formed with xenon, krypton, and argon. Most of these compounds contain fluorine since it is highly reactive. All right, so let's knock out the sample integrative exercise. You may wonder, why is this video a video all by itself? Because the sample integrative exercise takes a while this time. Okay, so y'all, the sample integrative exercise is kind of a sneak peek almost of what to expect for a large free response question on the AP exam. Like they're just gonna jump from topic to topic, but it's all gonna have like the basic uh, content that is throughout all the parts. But it could go from stoichiometry, jump over to thermochemistry, jump over to equilibrium. Um, so that's just what you have to be ready for. Okay, so that's why I like the sample integrated exercises in the book. So it says, bismuth of salicylate is the active ingredient in Pepto-Bismol. The covalent atomic radii of thallium and lead are 1.48 angstroms and 1.47 angstrom. Using these values, predict the radius of the element bismuth. We all, if you look at the periodic table, this is the location of them. We have bismuth, we have lead, and we have thallium. All right, so it told me that thallium is 1.48 angstroms, lead is 1.47 angstroms, I know as I go across a period on the periodic table, atomic size decreases. So what would I guess? Well, I would guess it's probably about point, uh, sorry, 1.46 angstrom. That's what I would put for that one. Okay, so you just have to measure trends for that. Okay, nobody expects you to have the radius of bismuth memorized. Okay, based on the numbers they give us, you should be able to figure out what it should be about. All right, it says, what accounts for the general increase in atomic radius going down group 15? Well, yeah, it doesn't matter which group you're going down. When we go down, atomic radius increases because larger energy levels are added. That's for all of the trends, okay? So the valence electrons are being added to larger energy levels that are farther from the nucleus. Okay, that's what's happening as you go down any of the groups for atomic radius. It says bismuth is a low melt, is in low melting alloys. Remember, alloys are mixtures with metallic properties. The element itself is a brittle white crystalline solid. How do these characteristics fit with the fact that bismuth is in the same periodic group with such non-metallic elements like nitrogen and phosphorus? Well, first of all, bismuth is at the very bottom. So we know as you go from top to bottom on the non-metals, it goes non-metallic down to metallic. And so that's why you're seeing metallic properties, like it's in alloys, it's a solid. But you're also seeing some non-metallic properties, like it's brittle. Um, so, like I said, because it's at the bottom of the group, we know it can be in a group with nonmetals because as you move down, the elements go from non-metallic, like N and P, which it brought up in here, to metallic, like BI, because it's much lower on the periodic table. All right, so next, it says Bi2O3 is a basic oxide. Write a balanced equation for its reaction with dilute nitric acid. If 6.77 grams of Bi2O3 is dissolved in dilute acidic solution to make 0.5 liters of solution, what is the molarity of the solution of Bi positive 3 ion? Okay, so first let's tackle the reaction part. Okay, we gotta do our reaction first. All right, so we have Bi2O3 
and we are reacting it with nitric acid. All right, so remember, we're just going to treat it like double displacement. We're going to bond the Bi with the NO3, and we're going to bond the H with the O to make water. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do the H and the O to make water, because that's the easier part. It doesn't matter which one you list first, though. All right, so now Bi is going to be with NO3. Well, y'all, Bi has a positive 3 charge, and NO3 has a negative 1 charge. So I need to balance my charges by putting 3 nitrates there. All right, so last step is, of course, to balance it. So I have 2 Bi, 1 Bi, so I need a 2. I have 1 nitrate. Here I have 3 nitrates, so I need a 3. Here I have 3 hydrogens, but here I only have 2 hydrogens. So what do we do when we have a 3 and a 2? We need to make both of them 6. Okay, so I'm going to put a 3 here and a 6 right there. All right. So... Moving on, then we have, let's see, what have I not looked at yet? Oh, so here I have three O's and I have three O's, just like that. All right, oh, whoops, no wonder I needed a six there. I just realized I had uh, six nitrates here. I wrote it so far away so I could write my charge for y'all. We have six nitrates. Okay, so that's why we originally needed a six there. Sorry about that. That was probably confusing. But see, we made it work out anyway. All right, so now let's tackle the other part. It says, if 6.77 grams of Bi2O3 is dissolved in dilute acidic solution to make 0.5 liters of solution, what is the molarity of the solution of Bi positive 3 ions? Okay, so y'all, we just got to start with what we know. So we have 6.77 grams of Bi2O3. Okay, so the first step is we're trying to get to molarity, so we know molarity is moles per liter. So clearly, I need to get moles. They gave me liter right here, okay? So I add up my molar mass for Bi2O3, and I got, ooh, a big one, 466 grams. And that, of course, equals one mole. But remember, y'all, we don't want the molarity of the Bi2O3. We just want it of Bi alone, okay? So the next step I can say is, okay, well, one mole or one molecule of Bi2O3 is going to make two, well, we can say mole, mole works. One mole of Bi2O3 is going to make two moles of the Bi ion, okay? And where are we getting the two moles from? Well, because it's Bi2. So every time one of these splits up, I'm going to get two Bi's. All right, so once I do that, I end up getting 0 0.029 moles of Bi with a positive 3 charge. So once I have moles, I can easily get molarity. So molarity is moles, which is 0 0.029, divided by liters, which is 0.5. Gave me that in the problem. All right, so once I solve, I get 0 0.058 molarity of Bi with a positive 3 charge. Okay, so see y'all, even though we were not even talking about stoichiometry in this problem, in this chapter, it can always come back in. That's what the free response questions, like I said, end up being like on the AP exam. It's like they may start talking about bismuth, but you're going to do stoichiometry with it. You're going to do an equilibrium problem with it. You may do electron configuration with it. You may do thermochem with it. You can do electrochem with it. Like it just goes all over the place. So you may hate the sample integrated, but they're good practice. All right. So part E out of part F. All right, so we have bismuth 209 is the heaviest stable isotope of any element. How many protons and neutrons are present in the nucleus? We all we know it's bismuth 209. So I look at the periodic table and I can see that the atomic number is 83. So how many protons? Well, protons are the atomic number. It's 83. How many neutrons? Well, for neutrons, I just do 209. Oops, excuse me, 209 minus 83, and so I get 126. So it's 126 neutrons. Okay, so see how every part of a free response question doesn't have to be hard. And notice it went from harder doing all that stoichiometry to easier. That's another thing some of y'all struggle with, is if they give you an easier one later in the question, it's like you've just given up at that point. So don't do that. All right, so last part. So it says the density of Bi at 25 degrees Celsius is 9.808 grams per centimeter cubed. How many Bi atoms are present in a cube of, an, of the element that is 5 centimeters on each edge? 
how many moles of the element are present. So the way I did this was I actually calculated moles first, um, and then I went to atoms. It doesn't really matter. Okay, so the important thing to realize is it's five centimeters on each edge. So that is, of course, volume is length times width times height, which is, of course, 125 centimeters cubed. Okay, so I gotta know my volume first. Once I know it's 125 centimeters cubed, then I can utilize this density. Okay, so y'all, one thing I've noticed in a lot of AP questions is they like to give you a lot of extra information. But usually if they give you density, you most of the time actually need to use that. Okay, so I have my centimeters cubed, so I need centimeters cubed on bottom. So how many? One, because this is saying 9.808 grams per centimeter, so like per one centimeter. So one centimeter is 9.808 grams. Okay, so that can get me to grams of my BI. And so then I went ahead and went straight to moles. So for BI, I looked at the periodic table and saw it's about 209 grams. So I'll put my 209 grams equals one mole. And y'all, all this was was molar mass of BI. And so then once I multiplied and divided, I got 5.87 moles of BI. So like I said, see, I just chose to do the moles first. It doesn't matter. All right, but it also asked me for atoms. So I took my 5.87 moles of BI. And so I said, okay, well, one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms. So my moles cancel. And once I multiplied, I ended up getting 3.53 times 10 to the 24 atoms of BI. Okay, and so see, again, we kind of hit stoichiometry again. Okay, stoichiometry just never goes away. All right, so hopefully you didn't see too many new things um, in this chapter because we should have covered most of this. Um, the trickiest part of this last video would, of course, be the sample integrative exercise because you're trying to pull a lot of different concepts together all at once. 